chapter three of winds of doctrine studies in contemporary opinion by george santayana this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter three the philosophy of m henri bergson part three yet this is what m bergson does in his whole defence of metaphysical vitalism and especially in the instance of the evolution of eyes by two different methods which is his palmary argument since in some mollusks and in vertebrates organs that coincide in being organs of vision are reached by distinct paths it cannot have been the propulsion of mechanism in each case he says that guided the developments which being divergent would never have led to coincident results but the double development must have been guided by a common tendency towards vision suppose what some young man in a laboratory may by this time have shown to be false that m bergson's observations have sounded the facts to the bottom it would then be of the ultimate nature of things that given light and the other conditions the two methods of development will end in eyes just as for a peasant it is of the ultimate nature of things that puddles can be formed in two quite opposite ways by rain falling from heaven and by springs issuing from the earth but as the peasant would not have reached a profound insight into nature if he had proclaimed the presence in her of a tendency to puddles to be formed in inexplicably different ways so the philosopher attains to no profound insight when he proclaims in her a tendency to vision if those words express more than ignorance they express the love of it even if the vitalists were right in despairing of further scientific discoveries they would be wrong in offering their verbiage as a substitute nature may possibly have only a very loose hazy constitution to be watched and understood as sailors watch and understand the weather but neptune and aeolus are not thereby proved to be the authors of storms yet m bergson thinks if life could only be safely shown to arise unaccountably that would prove the invisible efficacy of a mighty tendency to life but would the ultimate contexture and miracle of things be made less arbitrary and less a matter of brute fact by the presence behind them of an actual and arbitrary effort that such should be their nature if this word effort is not a mere figure of rhetoric a name for a movement in things of which the end happens to interest us more than the beginning if it is meant to be an effort actually and consciously existing then we must proceed to ask why did this effort exist why did it choose that particular end to strive for how did it reach the conception of that end which had never been realized before and which no existent nature demanded for its fulfilment how did the effort once made specific select the particular matter it was to transform why did this matter respond to the disembodied effort that it should change its habits not one of these questions is easier to answer than the question why nature is living or animals have eyes yet without seeking to solve the only real problem namely how nature is actually constituted this introduction of metaphysical powers raises all the others artificially and without occasion this side of m bergson's philosophy illustrates the worst and most familiar vices of metaphysics it marvels at some appearance not to investigate it but to give it an unctuous name then it turns this name into a power that by its operation creates the appearance this is simply verbal mythology or the hypostasis of words and there would be some excuse for a rude person who should call it rubbish the metaphysical abuse of psychology is as extraordinary in modern europe as that of fancy ever was in india or of rhetoric in greece we find for instance mr bradley murmuring as a matter almost too obvious to mention that the existence of anything not sentience is unmeaning to him or if i may put this evident principle in other words that nothing is able to exist unless something else is able to discover it yet even if discovered the poor candidate for existence would be foiled for it would turn out to be nothing but a modification of the mind falsely said to discover it existence and discovery are conceptions which the malicious criticism of knowledge which is the psychology of knowledge abused pretends to have discarded and outgrown altogether the conception of immediacy has taken their place 
this malicious criticism of knowledge is based on the silent assumption that knowledge is impossible whenever you mention anything it baffles you by talking instead about your idea of what you mention and if ever you describe the origin of anything it substitutes as a counter theory its theory of the origin of your description this however would not be a counter theory at all if the criticism of knowledge had not been corrupted into a negative dogma maintaining that ideas of things are the only things possible and that therefore only ideas and not things can have an origin nothing could better illustrate how deep this cognitive impotence has got into people's bones than the manner in which in the latest schools of philosophy it is being disavowed for unblushing idealism is distinctly out of fashion m bergson tells us he has solved a difficulty that seemed hopeless by avoiding a fallacy common to idealism and realism the difficulty was that if you started with self-existent matter you could never arrive at mind and if you started with self-existent mind you could never arrive at matter the fallacy was that both schools innocently supposed there was an existing world to discover and each thought it possible that its view should describe that world as it really was what now is m bergson's solution that no articulated world either material or psychical exists at all but only a tendency or enduring effort to evolve images of both sorts or rather to evolve images which in their finer texture and vibration are images of matter but which grouped and foreshortened in various ways are images of minds the idea of nature and the idea of consciousness are two apperceptions or syntheses of the same stuff of experience the two worlds thus become substantially identical continuous and superposable each can merge insensibly into the other to perceive all the influences of all the points of all bodies would be to sink to the condition of a material object to perceive some of these influences by having created organs that shut out the others is to be a mind this solution is obtained by substituting as usual the ideas of things for the things themselves and cheating the honest man who was talking about objects by answering him as if he were talking about himself certainly if we could limit ourselves to feeling life flow and the whole world vibrate we should not raise the question debated between realists and idealists but not to raise a question is one thing and to have solved it is another what has really been done is to offer us a history on the assumption of idealism of the idea of mind and the idea of matter this history may be correct enough psychologically in such as a student of the life of reason might possibly come to but it is a mere evasion of the original question concerning the relation of this mental evolution to the world it occurs in in truth an enveloping world is assumed by these hereditary idealists not to exist they rule it out a priori and the life of reason is supposed by them to constitute the whole universe to be sure they say they transcend idealism no less than realism because they mark the point where by contrast or selection from other objects the mind has come to be distinguished but the subterfuge is vain because by mind they mean simply the idea of mind and they give no name except perhaps experience to the mind that forms that idea matter and mind for these transcendentalists posing as realists merge and flow so easily together only because both are images or groups of images in an original mind presupposed but never honestly posited it is in this forgotten mind also as the professed idealists urge that the relations of proximity and simultaneity between various lives can alone subsist if to subsist is to be experienced there is however one point of real difference at least initially between the idealism of m bergson and that of his predecessors the universal mind for m bergson is in process of actual transformation it is not an omniscient god but a cosmic sensibility in this sensibility matter with all its vibrations felt in detail forms one moving panorama together with all minds which are patterns visible at will from various points of view in that same woof of matter and so the great experiment crawls and shoots on 
the dream of a giant without a body mindful of the past uncertain of the future shuffling his images and threading his painful way through a labyrinth of cross-purposes such at least is the notion which the reader gathers from the prevailing character of m bergson's words but i am not sure that it would be his ultimate conclusion perhaps it is to be out of sympathy with his spirit to speak of an ultimate conclusion at all nothing comes to a conclusion and nothing is ultimate many dilemmas however are inevitable and if the master does not make a choice himself his pupils will divide and trace the alternative consequences for themselves in each direction if they care most for a real fluidity as william james did they will stick to something like what i have just described but if they care most for immediacy as we may suspect that m bergson does they will transform that view into something far more orthodox for a real fluidity and an absolute immediacy are not compatible to believe in real change you must put some trust in representation and if you posit a real past and a real future you posit independent objects in absolute immediacy on the contrary instead of change taken realistically you can have only a feeling of change the flux becomes an idea in the absolute like the image of a moving spiral always flowing outwards or inwards but with its centre and its circumference always immovable duration we must remember is simply the sense of lasting no time is real that is not lived through therefore various lives cannot be dated in a common time but have no temporal relations to one another thus if we insist on immediacy the vaunted novelty of the future and the inestimable freedom of life threaten to become like all else the given feeling of novelty or freedom in passing from a given image of the past to a given image of the future all these terms being contained in the present and we have reverted to the familiar conception of absolute immutability in absolute life m bergson has studied plotinus and spinoza i suspect he has not studied them in vain nor is this the only point at which this philosophy when we live a while with it suddenly drops its mask of novelty and shows us a familiar face it would seem for instance that beneath the drama of creative evolution there was a deeper nature of things for apparently creative evolution apart from the obstacle of matter which may be explained away idealistically has to submit to the following conditions first to create in sequence not all at once second to create some particular sequence only not all possible sequences side by side and third to continue the one sequence chosen even if the additions of every new moment were irrelevant to the past no sequence no vital persistence or progress would be secured and all effort would be wasted these are compulsions but it may also i suppose be thought a duty on the part of the vital impulse to be true to its initial direction and not to halt as it well might like the self-reversing will of schopenhauer on perceiving the result of its spontaneous efforts necessity would thus appear behind liberty and duty before it this summons to life to go on and these conditions imposed upon it might then very plausibly be attributed to a deity existing beyond the world as is done in religious tradition and such a doctrine if m bergson should happen to be holding it in reserve would perhaps help to explain some obscurities in his system such for instance as the power of potentiality to actualize itself of equipoise to become suddenly emphasis on one particular part and of spirit to pursue an end chosen before it is conceived and when there is no nature to predetermine it it has been said that m bergson's system precludes ethics i cannot think that observation just apart from the moral inspiration which appears throughout his philosophy which is indeed a passionate attempt to exalt or debase values into powers it offers i should say two starting points for ethics in the first place the elan vital ought not to falter although it can do so therefore to persevere labour experiment propagate must be duties and the opposite must be sins in the second place freedom in adding uncaused increments to life ought to do so in continuation of the whole past though it might do so frivolously therefore it is a duty to be studious consecutive loyal 
you may move in any direction but you must carry the whole past with you i will not say this suggests a sound system of ethics because it would be extracted from dogmas which are physical and incidentally incredible nor would it represent a mature and disillusioned morality because it would look to the future and not to the eternal nevertheless it would be deeply ethical expressing the feelings that have always inspired hebraic morality a good way of testing the calibre of a philosophy is to ask what it thinks of death philosophy said plato is a meditation on death or rather if we would do justice to his thought an aspiration to live disembodied and schopenhauer said that the spectacle of death was the first provocation to philosophy m bergson has not yet treated of this subject but we may perhaps perceive for ourselves the place that it might occupy in his system footnote five m bergson has shown at considerable length that the idea of non-existence is more complex psychologically than the idea of existence and posterior to it he evidently thinks this disposes of the reality of non-existence also for it is the reality that he wishes to exercise by his words if however non-existence and the idea of non-existence were identical it would have been impossible for me not to exist before i was born my non-existence then would be more complex than my existence now and posterior to it the initiated would not recoil from this consequence but it might open the eyes of some catechumens it is a good test of the malicious theory of knowledge End of footnote five. life according to him is the original and absolute force in the beginning however it was only a potentiality or tendency to become specific lives life had to emphasize and bring exclusively to consciousness here and there special possibilities of living and where these special lives have their chosen boundary if this way of putting it is not too fichtian they posit or create a material environment matter is the view each life takes of what for it are rejected or abandoned possibilities of living this might show how the absolute will to live if it was to be carried out would have to begin by evoking a sense of dead or material things about it it would not show how death could ever overtake the will itself if matter were merely the periphery which life has to draw round itself in order to be a definite life matter could never abolish any life as the ring of a circus or the sand of the arena can never abolish the show for which they have been prepared life would then be fed and defined by matter as an artist is served by the matter he needs to carry on his art yet in actual life there is undeniably such a thing as danger and failure m bergson even thinks that the facing of increased dangers is one proof that vital force is an absolute thing for if life were an equilibrium it would not displace itself and run new risks of death by making itself more complex and ticklish as it does in the higher organisms and the finer arts footnote six this argument against mechanism is a good instance of the difficulties which mythological habits of mind import unnecessarily into science an equilibrium would not displace itself but an equilibrium is a natural result not a magical entity it is continually displaced as its constituents are modified by internal movements or external agencies and while many a time the equilibrium is thereby destroyed altogether sometimes it is replaced by a more elaborate and perilous equilibrium as glaciers carry many rocks down but leave some here and there piled in the most unlikely pinnacles and pagodas End of footnote six. yet if life is the only substance how is such a risk of death possible at all i suppose the special life that arises about a given nucleus of feeling by emphasizing some of the relations which that feeling has in the world might be abolished if a greater emphasis were laid on another set of its relations starting from some other nucleus we must remember that these selections according to m bergson are not apperceptions merely they are creative efforts the future constitution of the flux will vary in response to them 
each mind sucks the world so far as it can into its own vortex a cross apperception will then amount to a contrary force two souls will not be able to dominate the same matter in peace and friendship being forces they will pull that matter in different ways each soul will tend to devour and to direct exclusively the movement influenced by the other soul the one that succeeds in ruling that movement will live on the other i suppose will die although m bergson may not like that painful word he says the lower organisms store energy for the higher organisms to use but when a sheep appropriates the energy stored up in grass or a man that stored up in mutton it looks as if the grass and the sheep had perished their elan vital is no longer theirs for in this rough world to live is to kill nothing arises in nature lucretius says save help by the death of some other thing of course this is no defeat for the elan vital in general for according to our philosopher the whole universe from the beginning has been making for just that supreme sort of consciousness which man who eats the mutton now possesses the sheep and the grass were only things by the way and scaffolding for our precious humanity but would it not be better if some being should arise nobler than man not requiring abstract intellect nor artificial weapons but endowed with instinct and intuition and let us say the power of killing by radiating electricity and might not men then turn out to have been mere explosives in which energy was stored for convenient digestion by that superior creature a shocking thought no doubt like the thought of death and more distressing to our vital feelings than is the pleasing assimilation of grass and mutton in our bellies yet i can see no ground except a desire to flatter oneself for not crediting the elan vital with some such digestive intention m bergson's system would hardly be more speculative if it entertained this possibility and it would seem more honest the vital impulse is certainly immortal for if we take it in the naturalistic exoteric sense for a force discovered in biology it is an independent agent coming down into matter organizing it against its will and stirring it like the angel the pool of bethesda though the ripples die down the angel is not affected he has merely flown away and if we take the vital impulse mystically and esoterically as the only primal force creating matter in order to play with it the immortality of life is even more obvious for there is then nothing else in being that could possibly abolish it but when we come to immortality for the individual all grows obscure and ambiguous the original tendency of life was certainly cosmic and not distinguished into persons we are told it was like a wireless message sent at the creation which is being read off at last by the humanity of to-day in the naturalistic view the diversity of persons would seem to be due to the different material conditions under which one and the same spiritual purpose must fight its way towards realization in different times and places it is quite conceivable however that in the mystical view the very sense of the original message should comport this variety of interpretations and that the purpose should always have been to produce diverse individuals the first view as usual is the one which m bergson has prevailingly in mind and communicates most plausibly while he holds to it he is still talking about the natural world and so we still know what he is talking about on this view however personal immortality would be impossible it would be if it were aimed at a self-contradiction in the aim of life for the diversity of persons would be due to impediments only and souls would differ simply in so far as they mutilated the message which they were all alike trying to repeat they would necessarily when the spirit was victorious be reabsorbed and identified in the universal spirit this view also seems most consonant with m bergson's theory of primitive reality as a flux of fused images or a mind lost in matter to this view too is attributable his hostility to intelligence in that it arrests the flux divides the fused images and thereby murders and devitalizes reality of course the destiny of spirit would not be to revert to that diffused materiality for the original mind lost in matter had a very short memory it was a sort of cosmic trepidation only 
whereas the ultimate mind would remember all that in its efforts after freedom it had ever superadded to that trepidation or made it turn into even the abstract views of things taken by the practical intellect would i fear have to burden the universal memory to the end we should be remembered even if we could no longer exist on the other more profound view however might not personal immortality be secured suppose the original message said translate me into a thousand tongues in fulfilling its duty the universe would then continue to divide its dream into phantom individuals as it had to insulate its parts in the beginning in order to dominate and transform them freely so it would also continue to insulate them so as not to lose its cross vistas and its mobility there is no reason then why individuals should not live forever but a condition seems to be involved which may well make belief stagger it would be impossible for the universe to divide its images into particular minds unless it preserved the images of their particular bodies also particular minds arise according to this philosophy in the interests of practice which means biologically to secure a better adjustment of the body to its environment so that it may survive mystically too the fundamental force is a half-conscious purpose that practice or freedom should come to be or rather that an apparition or experience of practice and freedom should arise for in this philosophy appearance is all to secure this desirable apparition of practice special tasks are set to various nuclei in felt space such for instance as the task to see and the image of a body in this case that of an eye is gradually formed in order to execute that task for evidently the absolute can see only if it looks and to look it must first choose a point of view and an optical method this point of view and this method posit the individual they fix him in time and space and determine the quality and range of his passive experience they are his body if the absolute then wishes to retain the individual not merely as one of its memories but as one of its organs of practical life it must begin by retaining the image of his body his body must continue to figure in that landscape of nature which the absolute life as it pulses keeps always composing and recomposing otherwise a personal mind a sketch of things made from the point of view and in the interests of that body cannot be preserved m bergson accordingly should either tell us that our bodies are going to rise again or he should not tell us or give us to understand that our minds are going to endure i suppose he cannot venture to preach the resurrection of the body to this weak-kneed generation he is too modern and plausible for that yet he is too amiable to deny to our dilated nostrils some voluptuous whiffs of immortality he asks if we are not led to suppose that consciousness passes through matter to be tempered like steel to constitute distinct personalities and prepare them for a higher existence other animal minds are but human minds arrested men at last what men i wonder are capable of remembering all and willing all and controlling their past and their future so that we shall have no repugnance in admitting that in man though perhaps in man alone consciousness pursues its path beyond this earthly life elsewhere he says in a phrase already much quoted and perhaps destined to be famous that in man the spirit can spurn every kind of resistance and break through many an obstacle perhaps even death here the tenor has ended on the inevitable high note and the gallery is delighted but was that the note set down for him in the music and has he not sung it in falsetto the immediate knows nothing about death it takes intelligence to conceive it and that perhaps is why m bergson says so little about it and that little so far from serious but he talks a great deal about life he feels he has penetrated deeply into its nature and yet death together with birth is the natural analysis of what life is what is this creative purpose that must wait for sun and rain to set it in motion what is this life that in any individual can be suddenly extinguished by a bullet what is this elan vital that a little fall in temperature would banish altogether from the universe the study of death may be out of fashion but it is never out of season the omission of this which is almost the omission of wisdom from philosophy warns us that in m bergson's thought we have something occasional and partial 
the work of an astute apologist a party man driven to desperate speculation by a timid attachment to prejudice like other terrified idealisms the system of m bergson has neither good sense nor rigour nor candour nor solidity it is a brilliant attempt to confuse the lessons of experience by refining upon its texture an attempt to make us halt for the love of primitive illusions in the path of discipline and reason it is likely to prove a successful attempt because it flatters the weaknesses of the moment expresses them with emotion and covers them with a faint at scientific speculation it is not however a powerful system like that of hegel capable of bewildering and obsessing many who have no natural love for shams m bergson will hardly bewilder his style is too clear the field where his just observations lie the immediate is too well defined and the mythology which results from projecting the terms of the immediate into the absolute and turning them into powers is too obviously verbal he will not long impose on any save those who enjoy being imposed upon but for a long time he may increase their number his doctrine is indeed alluring instead of telling us as a stern and contrite philosophy would that the truth is remote difficult and almost undiscoverable by human efforts that the universe is vast and unfathomable yet that the knowledge of its ways is precious to our better selves if we would not live befooled this philosophy rather tells us that nothing is truer or more precious than our rudimentary consciousness with its vague instincts and premonitions that everything ideal is fictitious and that the universe at heart is as palpitating and irrational as ourselves why then strain the inquiry why seek to dominate passion by understanding it rather live on work it matters little at what and grow it matters nothing in what direction exert your instinctive powers of vegetation and emotion let your philosophy itself be a frank expression of this flux the roar of the ocean in your little sea-shell a momentary posture of your living soul not a stark adoration of things reputed eternal so the intellectual faithlessness and the material servility of the age are flattered together and taught to justify themselves theoretically they cry joyfully non peccavi which is the modern formula for confession m bergson's philosophy itself is a confession of a certain mystical rebellion and atavism in the contemporary mind it will remain a beautiful monument to the passing moment a capital film for the cinematography of history full of psychological truth and of a kind of restrained sentimental piety his thought has all the charm that can go without strength and all the competence that can go without mastery this is not an age of mastery it is confused with too much business it has no brave simplicity the mind has forgotten its proper function which is to crown life by quickening it into intelligence and thinks if it could only prove that it accelerated life that might perhaps justify its existence like a philosopher at sea who to make himself useful should blow into the sail End of chapter 3 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine